It's a proud day for your mom. You're finally following in her footsteps. She meets you at the gate to the gardens. Hello, Sprout, she says, sounding chipper. Come on, we've got a lot to cover before you'll be able to keep up with the rest of us. Finally, some real farming. Your mom shows you around the fields and the geoponics domes. You'll mostly be working in the fields with the hardier earth crops like the potatoes and the corn, as well as the native plants we've managed to cultivate. She shakes her head. And with the state of the crops right now, we need a miracle. She's right. The crops are worryingly meager. Sickly yellow soybeans and potatoes with lush, enormous leaves but barely any potatoes under them at all. Hello everyone, and welcome back to I Was a Teenage Exo Colonist. Last time we did a whole bunch of splorin, or trying to work on overcoming this food crisis. We've been a little greedy with the plant life, a little generous in other spots. Try and take the kind route when we can, but at the same time, our people are starving. If you like this kind of content, please consider liking and subscribing for more like it to come. Although, quick reminder, this is the last week of um, double uploads for Exocolonists. Starting next week, we will be having Saturday-Sunday episodes instead. We are at the boss encounter of the uh, foraging area here. The Valley of Vertigo. I don't know what to expect. I'm well. I mean, I kind of expecting some manticore based on the eggs, um, but also like I really wish we had a rifle. You're alone exploring an unmapped area of the Valley of. Oh right, we did read that last time. Although I should read it again. Uh, unmapped area of the Valley of Vertigo. The pollen is thick here, and your air filter is overworked. A warning light has been flashing orange for the last ten minutes. But there are plants here that you've never seen before. Flowers with intense rainbow hues and strange lumps of fungal matter which pulse as if they're breathing. You cut some samples. Utopia will totally give you extra kudos for these. The pollen is especially thick up ahead. Deep fuchsia and shimmering with color. Everything here seems to dance with tiny flecks of reflected light. It's kind of magical. That seems very dangerous. We are going to press forward though. You push forward into the suffocating pink fog. It's so thick you can only see a few meters ahead. You follow the glimmering towards where it's densest. You come upon a glade filled with what seems to be strange topiaries. They loom out of the glittering fog, each in the shape of an animal. They're all formed from the same spongy, glittering pink substance and dotted with finger-length fungal growths. Um... Those used to be creatures, I feel like. You're so distracted you almost fall into a large hole in the center of the glade. Perception 10 or greater. Yeah, we're gonna check for danger first. You've seen plant-like animals before. Are these topiaries actually predators waiting for you to get close? They, you watch them carefully from the edge of the glade. They're completely still, not breathing. There are no life signs. Good. Your enviro suit beeps a warning. I'm gonna take a sample. Plus one shimmer cure, nice. As you bend down to take a sample, you realize the dense shining haze is coming from the topiaries. The fog is seeping out of holes at the end of each fungal growth. You break off a few of the growths into a collection vial. I don't think we have time for everything. You remember helping Tanj for extra credit in biology class. She said that the shimmer, the seasonal illness that affects your dad and pollen, is some kind of colonizing fungal growth. Could this be related? Your envirosote beeps a louder warning. Look into the hole. At the bottom of the hole is a cave. It slopes down gradually towards the cave floor, only about four meters below, and disappears underground. You aren't sure how far the cave continues past that point. It's dark down there, obviously, but not silent. There's some kind of strange rhythmic whirring coming from further inside the cave. You hold up your palm and shine your hollow palm's light. The cave floor glitters with pink fungus, and the air is ominously choked with it. Don't mind me as I pop a cheeky little save. I'll inspect the topiaries first. The topiary you choose is a large, dog-sized quadruped which appears to be kneeling. It's 
far too lifelike. Yeah, I had a feeling. As you get closer, you realize with growing revulsion that this was once a living creature, now encased, or transformed, entirely into the sparkling pink fungus. It's dead. The more you think about it, the more you're sure this is related to the shimmer. Climb into the hole, baby. You make your way down the gentle slope towards the cave. The thick, shimmering pollen makes it hard to see further than your hand. You see... Three glowing vats set into the floor, like neon hot tubs, and an old-fashioned mechanical interface set into the cave wall. The reflecting glow from the vats flickers on the save cave ceiling, ghost-like and beautiful. You feel a strong urge to take off your mask and stay a while. Stay a while and listen. Get out of here with two exclamation marks, yeah baby. Poke at the mechanical interface. Uh, we're, no, 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 don't take your mask off. Like, stay, but, like, don't take your mask off. Unmasked, you cross the cave and lay your hands on the interface. Feel spongy, almost alive. Instantly, you can feel your mind blasted open by, by everything, all at once. As if a thousand pairs of eyes all turned their terrible gaze upon you. You're thrown back by the shock, which brings you back to your senses with a snap. The pollen! Sparkling dust feels like tiny knives in your sinuses, and a heavy choking pain in your lungs. Why did you take your mask off? You slap your suit helmet back on to see its light flashing red, indicating filter overload. You lurch out of the cave and back towards the checkpoint, barely able to breathe. You know you need to get out of here, but a small part of you wants to go back down there, to stay in this glade. Forever. Yeah, that's not sinister AF. As you near the checkpoint, Utopia runs out to help you. You instinctively turn back, unthinking, wanting to return to the fog, to those strange statues. You collapse in her arm. Several days later, you wake. You don't remember much, just a great choking heaviness in your lungs, and the world swallowing you up over your, and closing over your head. You have snippets of conscious thought from the last few days, but it's hard to tell if it was a dream or not. Escaping the Shimmer Glade. It's a zero. Minus five toughness. Excuse you? Rude. Gain status injured. Physical skills reduced by one. Heal by relaxing. Well, I mean, I need to do that anyway. You remember Tammy sitting beside by your bedside, her cool hand on your forehead. But she's dead. That part must have been a dream. It feels like you had a fever once, hot and sticky, achy all over like you've been boiled alive. You're still terribly weak, and there is a pain in your chest like someone has been sitting on it. It takes all of your energy just to breathe. You live, but your body took a serious hit and may never be quite the same. Okay, so, like, we can report all the shit we saw, though, right? Like, that's important. And we, we got the shit. Uh, have to trust. It's time for Vertumnalia, the yearly midsummer celebration where the colony gives thanks for its good fortune. Well, it would be. But as you file into the main square, you can't help but notice that the feast table is nearly empty. What Anne lacked in resources, she made up with care. The dishes are lovingly plated. Soy cakes glisten, steam rises from buns stuffed with mints, and there are great pitchers of vegetable broth rendered out from even the most inedible food scraps. There's a neat stack of sugar cubes for dessert. Whole sugar, what a luxury! In an underwhelming feast, that'll be the highlight. Governor Uticott's welcoming speech this year is... short. Her frail body trembles as she welcomes you all to Vertumnalia with a dry, whispery voice, and has to be helped off stage. Like all of you, she has been feeling the effects of the famine. Oh good, I get to do the talent show! That's all that matters! Everyone clears away the chairs for the annual competition. Which one do you participate in this year? Always a talent show. Please let me do magic again. You and Mars report to the talent stage for the talent competition. Dice is nowhere to be seen. Aww. Mars frowns, looking around as if he's lying in wait. Oh, boo. She grumbles. He always made me look good. 
If it's just you, I'm only the best out of two. Mars has been working on her speech craft. This year, she gives a speech inspired by great leaders of Earth, linking their philosophies into a sort of mega-theory about how the greatest works of human history have come from overcoming our greatest struggles through ingenuity and cooperation. She can't help herself from drawing parallels to the current famine, the failony of colony leadership to prepare for it, and how the Council clearly needs newer, younger voices to be able to imagine the future. <laughs> the Council isn't impressed by that part. Because it's Mars, the climax of the speech resolves with inspirational music and fireworks. It's very exciting. You're up. What have you prepared? Dramatic reading, a comedy routine, or an original song? I mean, you know what? We haven't heard too much, like, actual new music coming out of here yet. And we did do a singing one, so why don't we do it again? Goal 58! Dude, I've done harder goals than that out there in the wild. Come off it. You win my strength now. We're gonna go... Oh, hey now, hey now. Two, three, four... Oh, it's plus one just in general, because that's plus one. Um, why don't we go two, three, three, five? Eighteen, twenty-four. Yeah, go for it. And just a twenty. We got that through raw numbers alone. Um, double talent show championship champion in the talent show it feels kind of cocky could have gotten a 36 but we still won Mars's act was a tough one to follow but the talent show is judged by audience applause given how tired and hungry everyone is your lighthearted and simple song is what the people really want Mars looks miffed at the snub, but shakes your hand. Geniuses are rarely appreciated in their time. After the festivities, the whole colony takes a few days off for a break. Well, except for geoponics, and the foragers, and the kitchens. Oh, and everyone who uses the break from their usual work to help out in the places that didn't close. Okay, it's not really a break, but you try to take it easy anyway. I mean, we still have to rest because we're injured. Ooh, new perk. Oh, we got a biology perk. Cool. Unlocks Xenobotany Research and Geoponics. Cool. Alright, we're not going out there. Yo, you won't even let me look? Man, that's cold. Daddy? Your dad sneaks you a crumpled up soy ration bar from his pocket. Here, have this, he says. I didn't finish it at lunchtime, and I'm not hungry. You know that's a lie, but you eat it anyway. You're just so hungry. Your dad is running some kind of test on the trippets. He's playing different chords and trying to see if they have language or are just making instinctive animal calls. You help him by holding up random objects and trying to determine if their sounds map to under any understanding of what they're seeing. Card to the right becomes five. They're either saying, kill all humans, or Linguini sports ball, your dad says, staring at the readout on his hollow palm. I just can't be sure. Cute. Your dad is looking a little gaunt. There wasn't a lot of weight on him to lose in the first place, so the rationing is hitting him harder than most. He's still hard at work, though. Nothing can keep your dad from getting things done. Yeah, okay, the fact that we don't have an 80 with him is worrying, and now I'm nearly positive he's gonna die, and I might cry. Just, just so that, like, just so that we're clear, I might cry.
Um, okay, well, we have to rest, which is annoying. Lookout duty. Yeah, no, that's fine. We'll relax on the walls. You and Dice both blow off your responsibilities by relaxing on the wall. <clears throat> to be honest, I could have done other things and then rested, but then I would have stayed injured. That was maybe not the greatest idea, but whatever. By relaxing on the wall. Sometimes you talk about stuff, but mostly you just give him space. He shows you a simple game he made on his hollow palm, where you can buy and trade resources to make something he calls profit. He says he got the idea from an old game he found on the hollow archives, but it feels kind of pointless. You're just making numbers go up. Shut it. Making numbers go up is gorgeous. Okay, we're never forgetting paint candy, even if it's a two. Just so we're clear on that. Never ever. Alright, are we are we cured? Yes, and we're popular. Kudos doubled for three months. Uh, I'd like I haven't been taking advantage of that. Sorry, I, ha I haven't been reading their extra lines j just now. Uh, Mars clutches her stomach and acts faint. I'm starving, she whines. Don't they see I'm literally wasting away here? You would offer her a protein bar, but she's probably just complained that she's being reduced to taking charity, so you just keep it to yourself. <clears throat> How's the food situation doing now? Minus 40%. We've been making some heavy headway. I'd like to head back out there, but I have a feeling there isn't anything else for us to do except grab those two eggs, and that's not worth doing an entire month on. Yo, bro, have an egg. Two collectibles remaining. Yeah, that doesn't really help. One collectible remaining. All events have respawned. I don't think there's going to be any food out here. But it might be worth going out to check. Or we could work on our kudos so we can get that rifle. I kind of want that rifle. We're going to do some work. Tanj arrives to pick up a box of clinking glass beakers and test tubes, barely talking to you before breezing away. She looks busy, as usual. 23? Yo, okay. I'm only doing that because I want the plus one skill. 3... No gems. A potent brew. That's only a 21, eh? So one to a card, change suit to... Oh, first collectible use is free. I should definitely use that then. Absorbent brain one. Cool, cool. 18 kudos. Yeah, I really should have uh, not done that relaxing when I did it. That was very poorly timed. We still got popular. We still got popular. We should do more work and take advantage of that money. Cal is standing in the garden watching a pair of Dorb's moth flutter overhead. They're the worst, he says, frowning. We gotta find a way to a better place to put the grain. Because they just get in everywhere. You'd be surprised what kind of hole they can squeeze through. Hey, did you, did you know she is hungry?
Dad's gonna die. By the work as a farmer. You ask your mom if they're still looking for people for that farming job. Sure, kiddo, she tells you. And that is assuming you've been studying up on your biology. School comes first. Your mom claps you on the back. Oof. She's just as strong as she looks. Great, she says. Come see me in geoponics when you're ready to start. It'll be more fun than wheeling dirt around, I promise. I'm only going to do that if it helps food. Ten, it gives us kudos. Ups our toughness, friendship with Cal. Those are a bit away from leveling up. And our toughness is dropping lower than I'd like. Uh, I don't know if it'll actually help with the food, though. You know what? We'll do it once. It's a proud day for your mom. You're finally following in her footsteps. She meets you at the gate to the gardens. Hello, Sprout, she says, sounding chipper. Come on, we've got a lot to cover before you'll be able to keep up with the rest of us. Finally, some real farming. Your mom shows you around the fields and the geoponics domes. You'll mostly be working in the fields with the hardier earth crops like the potatoes and the corn, as well as the native plants we've managed to cultivate. She shakes her head. And with the state of the crops right now, we need a miracle. She's right. The crops are worryingly meager. Sickly yellow soybeans and potatoes with lush, enormous leaves but barely any potatoes under them at all. You spend the rest of your day pulling weeds and watering plants. You're dirty up to your waist by the time you're finished, but it's good, honest work. You're proud to be able to do something that helps out the colony. Cal gives you a high five and invites you for a cool drink in the cafeteria. All the other agriculturalists join you. Of all the places in the colony you've worked, Geoponics is the most like a family. Maybe because they've always been your family, thanks to your mom and dad. Someone broke into the gardens last night and stole some green tomatoes. What a waste. Not only were they t probably too bitter to eat, but now you don't have the seeds to replant. Your mom is furious. Your mom calls everyone for an all-hands meeting. She looks grim as she surveys the group. Alright, farmers, listen up. Based on my projections, Geoponics should have been producing 70% of the colony's food by the end of our third year, she says. The rest was to be provided by stored rations and hydroponic algae greenhouses aboard the Stratospheric. The agriculturalists all nod. Everyone knows where this is going. Because we lost so much of our hydroponic equipment in the wormhole incident, as well as 90% of our soil and bacteria cultures, we're nowhere near the production we need to be at. We also had hoped to have domesticated at least one native crop, but as we found from the pixie beans last year, we have some more work to do on that front. She looks every one of you in the eyes. You're my people. My family. I'm not going to sugarcoat this for you. The colony is going to fi fail if we don't get a handle on agricultural production. People will die. You feel a pit in your stomach that's not just from hunger. You can't imagine someone as strong as your mother just wasting away. Your mother pulls up a hollow screen outlining work plans for the season. You feel your own hollow palm pulse as you receive a copy. There's so much life here on this planet, she mother says, but it seems to fight us at every turn. I've sent soil chemistry analysis to your palms, courtesy of geranium. The soil needs to be conditioned extensively to support earth crops. We need to cultivate more vertumnin crops in partnership with the foragers. We need to salvage what we can of hydroponics and get that up and running by the end of the year. Your mother would never stoop to being beaten, but you can see the lines of fatigue around her eyes. It'll take a superhuman amount of work to turn this around, but it is still possible. You are the people who will save this colony. I believe in us, and the miracles we can perform here. Plus one colony food. Thank you for being here to do the work. Now, let's get out there. Yeah, we're helping! Um, 28. Plus two bonus to pairs. Good to know. Two. Five. How? 
Wow, 34. I disagree, but okay. Mid-wet. We are no longer popular. We no longer get extra kudos up. I mean, honestly, we can just keep working in there. We need the food to be better. Uh, there's not much else we can do by exploring. So, we'll probably just keep it up. I really don't like the fact that Dad doesn't have another event. You tell him about the time Tange brought a skunk bug for show and tell in biology, and it got scared and made the worst, most smelliest, grossest stink you had ever smelled, and everyone thought Tange had farted. Then Professor Howell had to clean out the whole room, and it took weeks to get the smell out of the bean bags, and it was so gross. It was also kind of neat how such a tiny bug can make a whole room of kids run away. Cal laughs. I remember that, Garrett. Except the way I heard it, it wasn't Tange, it was you. Lies. Lies and slander. What are you working on? Radioactive plant. Ooh. I like radioactive plants. What's our toughness at? 38. Okay. Uh, let's double check, but we should be at minus 30 now. Minus 30. We're, if we do that for the last, this month, this month, and this month, that should bring us to 0%, which means we're producing as much as we're eating. We're neither losing nor gaining. And I can live with that. And then we can do some more exploring next year. Yeah, I think that's what we're going to do. Also, let's explore the Xenobotany lab. Hey, kiddo, your dad says, looking up from his work desk where he's dissecting a huge bell-shaped flower. Can you hand me that separator? I've really got my hands in things here. You hand him the tool, which he uses to wedge open some sort of weird stoma-like opening inside the bell. Gooey purple nectar oozes out and pools on the desk. Whoa! He exclaims. I thought I'd drain this little beauty. Can you get a, uh, a towel, I guess? You help him mop up the flower juice. Yuck! It's sticky and smells like rotting vegetables. When you're done, he looks at you with pride. You know, I've been thinking of getting one of you kids to come help me out re with researching the native plants, he says. You think you might be able to break off some time to help your old man in the lab? I know you've been studying biology, he adds. It's not as glamorous as gene tech research with instance, but it is important. He grins. Let me talk to your mom about it tonight before you go telling her. She's not a fan of alien plants, you know. If it were up to her, we'd fill these greenhouses with earth plants and nothing else. But there's got to be more on this planet that we can cultivate. If you find any cool plants while you're exploring, bring them here and we can take a look at them. Okay, but does that give us food? Two biology, two organizing, one friendship with Cal. 15 kudos and 10 stress. Hmm. We need the food increase. Also, I worry Dad's gonna die very soon. Sorry, Dad. Next year, we need to take the guaranteed up, I think. Add up our organizing, too. We'll do, we'll do the farm. Half the crops you pull look blighted, like they're moldy before you even pull them off the plant. Many of the leaves are pale and yellow. Your mom takes one look at them and starts muttering about nitrogen deficiency. 
You almost feel guilty breaking for lunch. The kitchens deliver you a watery sort of potato soup with some pale greens floating in it, and you eat every flavorless drop. Can't bear to waste a single spoonful. Barely gives you enough energy to make it through the rest of the day. This does suck. Your dad is a total nerd when it comes to crunching statistics about the colony's food production. Through him, you learn that the average person eats approximately 200 kilograms of dry rations every year. That works out to about 2,000 calories a day. There are about 100 colonists to feed at 2,000 calories a day, so in a year you need to produce about... Ah. Well, no matter how many times you think it over, the math is grim. Even with all your hard work, Geoponics is producing far, FAR less than the colony needs to survive. It all feels so hopeless. Knowing that all of your hard work still hasn't been enough, well, it breaks something in you. Hunger and desperation boil together in your stomach as you work like bitter acid. As you work like bitter acid. You're working so hard and you're still starving. You deserve to eat. You need to eat. If you don't eat, you're not going to be able to work as hard as you need to. So when it's just you and a wheelbarrow of anemic looking carrots, what do you do? Stealing food to survive? Fuck no. We'll have to at some point in playthroughs so that we can, um get every card but like no we're not we're not stealing food don't steal it which will give us a so hungry a zero but plus two to all other strength cards it took an extraordinary amount of willpower but you get all the carrots weighed and delivered to the kitchen this food is for everyone it's not a lot of food for 100 people but at least you'll all starve together We're only at negative 20 now. Oh, hey, look, there's our new card. Twenty-seven... And twenty-five. What if we do that? 33 even. 4, 5, 6, 7. Yeah, do it. Hell yeah. We almost have enough for the rifle! Your mom has always been one of the strongest people in the colony. But you can tell the famine is taking its toll on her. Between the long hours, the lack of sleep, and the strict rationing, she's beginning to look gaunt. Do I have any items? Not really. I am so worried about daddykins cause he is gonna die. You used to be able to go mono a mono with Nemi, but she's been training hard. You get your butt kicked all over the sports ball pitch. She leans over you while you were lying on the floor, completely gassed. <laughs> you okay? She laughs. I didn't go too hard, right? How we doing, everyone? Minus 20%. I'm getting that damn rifle before uh, the next attack. It's happening. It will be mine! Your mom was really counting on the rice crops to flourish on Vertumna, but no luck. The soil just isn't right. It hurts to have lost such a staple crop. Staple. You find your mom almost collapsed over a sack of soil, her head in her hands. When she hears you, her head snaps up and she wipes her eyes. You try to leave quietly before she realizes you saw her cry. You hear an uproar from the other side of the fields and run over, worried there's been an accident. 
unbelievably, people are cheering. Woo! Her mom proudly holds a potato plant over her head in one hand, her biceps straining under the weight of the tubers in the clumpy brown soil. You count three, five, seven! Seven perfect mature potatoes on just this one plant. Stretching all around you in the field, the leafy green tops of other plants wave in the breeze. You look around at the other agriculturalists. Some of them have tears of relief in their eyes, and everyone is smiling and laughing. Hell yeah, one more and we break even! All right. Three, three, four, five, six. That gives us 28. That gives us 32. Oh, wait a second. Oh, and that's just 29. Okay. Yeah, we'll take the 32. Two more, come on! That sucks! We're not gonna be able to buy the rifle before... Glow. It's been three seasons of heavy food rationing, getting more and more strict as the year dragged on and the fields continue to struggle. You've been wasting away. You all have. It's not just a lack of calories, there just aren't enough vitamins and good stuff in the food you are eating. Plus 40 stress. Your muscles ache all the time. Sometimes you feel strangely euphoric, filled with inexplicable energy, but often it feels like there are weights tied to your shoulders, pulling you down. You're tougher than most, but you still have trouble sleeping, despite being tired all the time. You spend the whole day in a dazed fog. At least you hardly feel the hunger now. For months, the idea of food plagued your thoughts, each one like a dagger in your stomach. They've been replaced by an odd sense of peace. Now you feel half-tethered to this reality, floating above everything like a balloon. Your friends stop working and retreat to their quarters. You lie to each other on the holonet, all saying you're okay, just taking it easy, waiting for the harvest. Well, the harvest came and went, as meager as ever. Your mother still hasn't given up and never rests, never stops working, as much as your dad begs her to. She must be sleeping in geoponics, because you hardly ever see her in, her fa in the family quarters anymore. From where you lie nestled in bed in your cozy fugue, it all seems like far, far too much effort to bother with. <sighs> We're only negative 10%. Let's help out as best we can. You're out there in the fields with her, being her sidekick, helping fetch things. She never slows down. When the robo-plow finally breaks under the pressure, she doesn't. She's out there even longer, doing everything by hand. Both your parents feel responsible for this famine, but as head of geoponics, your mom takes it personally. She's been skipping meals, relying on water and pressed soy bar rations. Just enough calories to keep a body moving, but not enough to stay healthy. Yet she never lets her up working herself to the bone, barely even sleeping, increasingly sallow-eyed and gaunt. You and your dad try to slow her down, but, well, she's a stubborn woman. If not her, she says, then who? You and your dad are in the lounge, slowly sipping your vegetable broth. Oh, shoot. When there's a commotion at the doors. Someone's run in, gasping for breath, yelling for you and your father to come to geoponics. Oh, no. Here I was worried about dad. Did mom die? You run over, knowing deep in the pit of your stomach that something terrible has happened. When you see the faces of the agriculturalists, your mom's people, you know that feeling is real. Fuck. Shit. Your dad sees her body first. He lets out a cry like something you've never heard before. A deep, unimaginable pain, dragged up from the darkest parts of where fear lives. We were so close. Your dad falls to his knees beside the frail body of your mother. 
He pulls her into his arms and sobs. Wretched and agonized. You don't even know what to think. Your mom always seemed larger than her body, but seeing her now, there's... There's nothing there. Just a fragile shell. They tell you she didn't even cry out. Aww. She just went to her knees. And they lay down in the dirt. And that was it. She's gone. Your mother's body is taken to the incinerator room. And that night, the colony gathers to pay their respects. Do you join them? Fuck yeah, we're joining! <sighs> like Tammy's funeral, the incinerator room has been cleared and a wreath of flowers placed over the mouth of the organics recycler. Their white astrantia, your mother's favorite flower, carefully carried over from Earth with the hopes of it flourishing on Vertumna. Just like you. You stand with your father and Aunt Anne. You would have caught and the rest of the council are here as well. Including Rhett. You're surprised to see tears rolling down his face. He's such a hard ass in the garrison. Cal is here with all the other agriculturalists. Yeah, but there was respect between those two. The rest of the colony waits in the canteen to offer their condolences after the service. <clears throat> Governor Uticott gives the eulogy. As a colony, we share our blessings, she begins solemnly. However, today, in sad company, we gather to share the burden of our grief. Fluorescent was born on Earth, but she, more than many of us, exemplified the spirit of our endeavor to bring life to beyond the stars. She bore life, not only in her body, but bringing it forth from the ground she so faithfully attended. The debt we owe to her is the kind that can never be repaid, she continues. It is with a deep and unbearable grief that we must continue on without her, in awe and respect for her sacrifice, the depth of which was never expected of her, but which she did not expect of anyone else. It is on her strong shoulders that she carries us still. Uticott closes the door to the recycler, and the particle disintegrators begin to reclaim the molecules that once formed your mother. Your father squeezes your shoulder, making a small, choked-off noise of pain. As a community, we remember Fluorescent. As a community, we return her body to the soil that nourishes us. In this way, her sacrifice is recognized in the manifest body of the colony. The ceremony is adjourned to the canteen, where a somber wake is held in your mother's memory. There isn't enough food to dull the emotions, and your empty stomach only reminds you of her unfinished work. Your father is the new head of geoponics. In a few hours, he receives your mother's remains so that he can add them to the colony's precious supply of brown soil from Earth. Actually having to, like, hold back a bit of... Not crying, but my throat is getting a bit choked up. You touch the cool lid of the container, marveling that your mother could fit in such a small box. You don't have to be... Okay... Your dad says quietly. His voice is thick with emotion. I know I'm not... I, I have to keep going where she left off, but if you can, you should take some time off. Hell no. Your mom wouldn't want you to be weak. She toiled too hard for you to sit around feeling sorry for yourself while there was work to be done. A few days after the funeral, surveyors return with an unexpected va uh, bounty from the Valley of Vertigo. It's enough to survive for another month. Until the new year, maybe, if you keep rationing. The colony will continue to limp along, but... without your mother. Damn. And now it's Glow. 
And we can't even work the fields because we have to relax. Dice scratches the back of his head. Um, sorry about your mom, he says. She was a super hard ass, but she was kind of okay if you didn't have to be around her, I guess. Wow, thanks, bud. Appreciate that. Hey, Nemster. Nemi picks at her facial scales. I can't believe your mom's gone, she says. She was, like, super tough. I'm so much cooler than my mom. Let me guess, you're at negative 10? Negative 10. Her note's still there. Chief Cultivator Geranium. <sighs> Alright, well, let's relax and maybe up our bond with our pets. Nope. The roar wakes you. It would wake the dead. It shakes the walls, rumbles through the ship's hull, and makes your heart skip a beat. You're paralyzed by a sudden clench of fear in your gut. Through your porthole window, you hear metal screeching and people shouting. Then, another roar. Guttural and rumbling like the sound of a mountain collapsing. Something enormous is out there. Obviously, we're going out to face it. You don't know what gives you the courage, but you run out to the fields to face the horrible creature. Face to f- <laughs> What the fuck? What the- Actual fuck! God! Damn, that thing is ugly! It has no face. In place of a face, or even a head, its body just unzips, revealing a mass of writhing pink tentacles and blinking eyes, pocked with jagged, asymmetrical teeth. It stands on four enormously powerful legs, each as wide across as tree trunks. Man, I really wish I had my rifle! I'm two kudos away! That is such bullshit! Oh, I'm so mad! <sighs> Clinging to its back and its thick, slug-like tail are clumps of lichen that glow faintly in the night. The creature is nearly twice the height of a greenhouse. It's standing on top of a flattened one. The wreckage of lattice and plants all around. Flickers of light from plas rifles and stun gloves light it from underneath, and the stench of ozone is thick in the air. You see Nemi and her brother Calm darting in and around its legs with their twin shocks of red hair. The faceless creature lurches into another greenhouse, oblivious to the soldiers trying to herd it away. The monster left a trail of destruction from where it smashed right through the walls. Smaller creatures are pouring in through the gap and heading towards... They're heading straight to command! You watch helplessly as the hordes of animals storm command, sneaking through torn away panels and smashing through windows. It's too far away to hear the screams, but Governor Uticott is inside. You have to do something. Nemian Calm, Governor Uticott, Faceless Monster. Shit, this is really bad. We don't have the rifle! Ugh, I'm so choked! Oh, this is a really tough choice. I feel like if I don't help them, Calm is gonna die, and if I don't help that, her, Uticot's gonna die, but she's gonna die soon anyway. You know what? Screw it. We're gonna be a big damn hero. I'll load if I have to. You run towards Geoponics, picking up a pitchfork as you cross through the barren fields. When Calm sees you, he gestures for you to flee. Get out of here, Garrett, he says. You're gonna get yourself killed! You grip your pitchfork in defiance. You're sick of being told to hide like a child. You want to fight. I want to see what the challenge is. 93? That's not impossible. I got this. I totally got this. Okay. We need to knock this shit right out of the park. 
card gets plus three. Alright, we'll take a 22. What do we have available to us? We've got redraw hand, we've got plus two to a card, and plus one to a card, change it to intellectual. Twenty-five, twenty-four, plus two to a card, twenty-eight, which means we need to get forty-three on this one. Thirty-two, we're close. Thirty-five. And we can push through for the rest. It's not ideal, but... What if we do it like this. 36. That's a little bit better. It's back to 35. 34, 36. I could also go for a redraw here. But we might get something worse. Hey now. I think that's the best we're going to be able to do. We're doing it. The faceless whips its tentacles around, slapping the ground and knocking into people, picking them up and throwing their helpless bodies like dolls, only to be crushed under its massive trunk-like feet. The fields are littered with bodies of the fallen. Sweat stings your eyes, but you somehow stay on your feet. You're not entirely certain how you manage it, but somehow you get on top of it, clambering up its thick tail with your pitchfork in one hand. Its skin is leathery and smooth, radiating a sickly heat. The defenders shout as they see you climb into its massive tentacles. You ready your pitchfork and thrust it into its horrible craw. The faceless roars, rearing back on its hind legs and flailing its tentacles around in an attempt to throw you off. You keep a hold of it as it kicks and bucks under you, trampling the defense squad underfoot. The defense line breaks, and the faceless takes off at a gallop towards the stratospheric- Oh no! Ooh, I got an achievement against all odds. Uh, with a roar that shakes your very molecules, it loses its balance for the last time and falls onto the ship. Metal screams as the ship buckles and gives way. Whole pieces of the quarter wing, quarter's wing shear off as your home opens like a tin can, spilling its contents into the square. The strato lurches and collapses under the creature's weight. That's really not good. You slide down from its corpse and run back to the fields, where wails of grief begin to join the whimpers of the dying. Shit! Yeah, <sighs> calm's gone. I knew I should have helped them. But then it would have destroyed more food. I mean, fuck, it already destroyed our home. Damn it! Your stomach sinks as you see Nemi bent over the body of her brother Calm. His body is bent at an unnatural angle. His eyes open and his face frozen in a sort of stupefied terror. He looks unreal. Like a wax mannequin, he's just... gone. Like that. Nemi lets out a primal scream of pain and holds him to her chest, rocking back and forth among the carnage. You accomplished the impossible, but at what cost? 
I wouldn't blame them if they blamed me. It's going to be a two-parter. They call you a hero, but... The council calls an all-colony meeting to face the aftermath of the attack. In the impressive gloom of glow, you gather near engineering with the other survivors. It's one of the few buildings still standing. The corpse of the Faceless still sits in the caved-in wreckage of the stratospheric, spilling its flaccid pink tentacles from its horrible zipper-toothed maw. It's already beginning to stink. They call you a hero for killing it. We got defeated a Faceless plus six if this has the highest value. That's pretty strong. But not everyone sees it that way. Your stunt got one of the defense squad trampled, and you did train the monster straight into the stratospheric. You were brave and lucky to survive, but it's hard to say if your actions made things better or worse. Governor Uticott was killed by the smaller creatures that swarmed command during the attack. Yep, in her absence, Seek addresses the colony. <sighs> Geoponics is gone. The greenhouse is destroyed and fields trampled. After a year of suffering, starving, and only barely scraping by, you're not just back where you started, it's even worse. Everything your mom sacrificed herself for, gone, in one night. The entire front half of the stratospheric has been destroyed. The living quarters, the canteen, the garrison, the lounge, even the creche, it's all gone. It's only by some stroke of luck that people hiding in the creche weren't all killed. So is this it? Are we dead? Seek solemnly reads the names of those who lost their lives. Too many, including Governor Uticott. You all stand for a moment of silence. You feel the weight of loss like a blow to your chest. Nemi and her family cry out when her brother Calm's name is called, and their quiet sobbing continues through the silence. With the living quarters destroyed, everyone moves into the engineering wing for shelter. You're crowded into the classroom with the other families. The adults try to make it seem like a sleepover, but you're all still so shaken. Nemi cries about her brother, and screams at anyone who tries to comfort her. Eventually, you just ignore her grief, as painful as it is to hear her sobbing throughout the night. Oh, go oh, yay, we gained the status in mourning. Bitch, I think we were already mourning! You feel like you've been awake for days, and you'll never fully sleep again. You try, but you keep jerking awake, crying out in fear. Eventually, you fall asleep, sitting up, held in your father's arms. Your sleep is fitful, but mercilessly dreamless. Wow. Like, actually, wow. Jesus. Like, what, what do we even do? Well! That sucks! But, unfortunately, we're out of time for today. So thank you everyone for joining me. I hope you had fun. And I will see you all next time, tomorrow, for some more I Was a Teenage XO Colonist.